This is Dr. James Spiegel in his teaching on the philosophy of religion. This is session number 12, Religious Pluralism. Okay, we're going to talk about religious pluralism, um, which <clears throat> you know, in this day and age, it's a, a, a major concern among a lot of people, not just scholars, but uh, you know, a typical person on the street wondering about um, the implications of the fact that the world you know, has all sorts of religions, 10 or 12 major religions, and then hundreds of others as well. Um, is there one true religion or are there many paths to God? <clears throat> That's the question here. Uh, so we'll talk about this. Uh, the problem of religious pluralism. <clears throat> so here are the principal views. Uh, there is the view known as religious pluralism which is the, <clears throat> the idea that many different religions lead to the ultimate reality, that you can find salvation um, through uh, many different uh, religions. And then there is uh, the view known as religious exclusivism, <clears throat> which is a view that only one religion is true and leads to the ultimate reality. And then a lesser known view, which is known as religious inclusivism, is the view that there is one true religion, but all religious devotees are covert followers of the true religion. So those are the, the, the three standard views, pluralism, exclusivism, and inclusivism. So let's look at a major proponent of the pluralist uh, view, which is John Hick. <clears throat> major philosopher of religion in the 20th century and into the 21st century. Hick uh, proposes that the various systems of salvation um, should be seen as, as he puts it, different forms of the more fundamental conception of a radical change from a profoundly unsatisfactory state to one that is limitlessly better because rightly related to the real. So we have all these different religions, um, all their different beliefs about God and their, and their various uh, practices, liturgies and so on. And these are all different expressions of a kind of singular human drive uh, to find God and to find ultimate uh, salvation. And Hick argues that there's a deep unity here, even though the, the various religions, in many cases, look, look very different. There's, an, there's a kind of core um, commonality among all the different religions. He adds that we can only assess these different salvation projects, as he calls them, insofar as we are able to observe their fruits in human life. So he. Uh, distinguishes a couple of different patterns of spiritual transformation. You have uh, saints or religiously devout people who withdraw from the world to, you know, uh, prayer, meditation, um, in a way that is uh, separate from uh, the rest of uh, the world and uh, human engagement, um, such as in a monastic context. That would be people like Julian of Norwich or Sri or Abindo or, or others who, who make that, uh, who take that approach. Then you have saints who seek to change the world on the other end of the spectrum, those who are very uh, much activists with regard to making a cultural impact uh, maybe even a political impact with their faith. People like Joan of Arc or Mahatma Gandhi would fall into, into that category. 
So there's a whole range of approaches in terms of um, the kind of life one leads as a consequence of one's religious transformation. Um, so in the end though, there are certain kinds of uh, characteristics that, that tend to uh, be observed in the religiously devout, whether you know, they take more of a separatist or more of an activist approach uh, in applying their faith. But how do we identify the kind of behavior that reflects that proper orientation to the divine reality? Hicks' answer is that by using moral criteria implied by the world religion's shared ethical insights, uh, namely that we should display the, as he puts it, unselfish regard for others that we call love or compassion. That is getting at the moral core of religious transformation. And when we look at you know, the devout in you know, the, the world's religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, we, we tend to find consistently these virtues um, of love and compassion. Hicks says that the personal virtues are pretty much the same within the different religio-cultural traditions and he concludes that, quote, we have no good reason to believe that any one of the great religious traditions has proved itself to be more productive of love or compassion than another. So that there's a kind of parity when it comes to <clears throat> the uh, capacity of a religious tradition to inspire virtue um, if one takes an honest look at the various religious traditions, particularly the major religious traditions like uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, is, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, and so on. So Hick offers a, a kind of Kantian analysis of the situation, maintaining that, quote, the mind is active in perception, <clears throat> imposing its own conceptual resources and habits on what one experiences in um, religious context or when it comes to the approach to God or the ultimate uh, spiritual reality. He calls it Kantian because Kant's epistemology, uh, in a nutshell, was that uh, we don't see the world um, in a kind of unfiltered, pure way. The mind is not just a simple mirror of nature, but rather the mind contributes certain categories through which uh, rational categories and, 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 and conceptual forms um, through which we interpret the world. Now, we, we typically don't notice that we're doing this, but that's just the nature of the human mind to impose a kind of structure on reality <coughs> um, such that uh, that enables us to kind of uh, understand things a certain way and to, to conceptualize uh, and to think about the world in a, in a certain way. Kant believed that that's just fundamental to the human epistemic condition. <clears throat> and that even such things as space and time and thinking about objects in terms of quantity and quality, um, that those were concepts that, that the mind imposes on reality. And we don't really know how the world is in itself. We just know how the world is as we experience it. That's a basic Kantian ex, uh, epistemological move. Hick believes that taking that approach to our, um, our conception of God and how we uh, approach the divine reality is helpful. Um, and he sees the, the different religious perspectives as giving us rational categories that then we apply <coughs> to um, our perspective on the divine. So, um, in light of all that, Hicks says that um, we make these two moves. First, postulate an ultimate 
transcendent divine reality that's beyond the scope of human concepts and direct experience. That we need to acknowledge <clears throat> there is a divine reality that is a kind of religious or spiritual in itself, to use the Kantian language, that exists independently of our thinking. That's the ultimate reality that's there. We're trying to get at this thing. Um, and the various, and this is the second point, the various religious deities and absolutes um, as manifestations of the real within different historical forms of human consciousness. Um, all of the different religious doctrines, theories, um, theologies are, yes, manifestations of or expressions of that ultimate reality as um, interpreted by us through these categories. So you have the ultimate reality, the, the divine in itself, and then you have uh, that reality as experienced by us through these theological religious categories and concepts. And because um, whole religions kind of pivot on and depend upon certain concepts and categories, you have um, some, some very different kinds of religious traditions, um, a whole variety of them that emerge, even though they're getting at the same thing. Um, it's because the concepts and categories differ from culture to culture and time to time. So Hick offers some clarifications here. One, to say that the deities worshiped by the world religions are appearances of the real is not to say that they're illusions. He's, he's not saying um, that uh, these are pure fictions because um, they are kind of interpretive devices. There is a, a reality there, um, but you know that reality is interpreted in, in different ways by different religious uh, groups and traditions. So again, it's like the analogy with Kant is is apropos because you know Kant doesn't believe that our um, our current experience is illusory or a fiction. He just believes that it's interpreted. It doesn't you know adequately or ultimately accurately reflect what's really there. In fact, we can't know exactly how. Uh, the thing in itself is um, precisely because we're always interpreting through our rational categories. And it would be the same way here, Hick would say, in terms of our religious approach to the ultimate reality, God, um, because we're always interpreting and getting a, a kind of um, interpretation uh, through this whatever our theological or religious framework is, you know, we, we can't really get at the divine in itself, um, but our interpretations are, are uh, they're, they're not mere fictions either. They're, they are that, they are interpretations and perspectives that are um, affected by the religious and theological categories that we use. Secondly, to say that the real is beyond the range of human concepts doesn't mean that formal logical concepts don't apply to it. So the Kantian analysis, he says, is the best alternative to the naturalistic interpretation of religion, that all such experiences of the divine are merely mental projections. <coughs> um, and a construction of the human imagination. So that, that naturalistic interpretation of religion, he's rejecting. Um, and the Kantian analysis is the, is the best way to resist that, that naturalistic idea that it's all, all these religions are, you know, postulating pure fictions. No, it's real. The ultimate reality, the God reality is real. Um, we just can't know what it is in itself. Hick distinguishes several levels at which religions differ doctrinally. Um, one is in terms of the con their conceptions of the ultimate reality. 
the nature of the real. Secondly, in terms of metaphysical beliefs, um, religions differ in this regard as well. Beliefs about the relation of the universe to the real. Um, creation, ex nihilo, or is it kind of emanation of the world from the being of God? You have different views about the, the origin of the universe. Human destiny, uh, you live one life and, and then it's the afterlife forever, or are there systems of reincarnation, views on heaven and hell. There are all sorts of uh, differences among the world religions regarding those metaphysical beliefs. Historical issues is another way in which uh, religions differ doctrinally, beliefs about the, uh, the nature of and, and exploits of Jesus of Nazareth, of Muhammad, of Gautama, uh, the Buddha, and so on. Hitt concludes that we must reject the old exclusivist dogma that salvation is confined to Christianity. Um, he notes Carl Rayner's inclusivist view that, quote, devout people of other faiths are anonymous Christians within the invisible church, even without knowing it, and thus within the sphere of salvation, end quote. And even a recent pope noted that every man without exception has been redeemed by Christ. Sometimes you'll hear people who are, um, who seem to be exclusivist talk in at least inclusivist language. People who are theologically orthodox recognizing that hmm, there is a certain wideness in God's mercy as Clark Pinnock once put it. But does it go all the way, to, does it go the, the whole distance to, to religious pluralism of someone like John Hick, where you know, all or at least many religions are equally effective at uh, providing salvation for the person who's, who's seeking God? Um, someone of a more exclusivist ilk, um, but I'd say a generous exclusivist is Keith Ward, the British scholar. Uh, Ward is critical of Hick and, uh, or his pluralist view. And here's how Ward characterizes the pluralistic uh, thesis. Um, this is quoting Ward. He says, religions provide different valid but culturally conditioned responses to a transcendent reality and offer ways of transcending self and achieving a limitlessly better state centered on that reality. That is Ward's way of summing up pluralism. Furthermore, on this view, all will or can be saved by adhering to their own religious traditions. You don't have to be a universalist to be a pluralist. You can be a pluralist without being universalist. You can be a universalist without being a pluralist. There's all sorts of combinations here. Um, but a lot of pluralists are universalists. Since all assertions affirm something, <clears throat> they must exclude something as well, Ward notes. For this reason, he says, quote, all truth claims are necessarily exclusive. Um, and he says that not all possible religious traditions can be equally true, authentic, or valid. There's incompatibility here when it comes to um, particular religions, claims about the nature of God and salvation and so on. To the extent that they make claims, then there is possibility for contradiction or mutual incompatibility of views. Um, so Ward rejects uh, what he calls extreme pluralism, uh, presumably the notion that all religions are equally true. That's just not, that's just not possible since they make competing claims. But then Ward distinguishes a version of pluralism that he calls hard pluralism, which is different than what he's calling extreme pluralism. Hard pluralism being the view that many 
major religions, quote, do not contain mutually exclusive beliefs about, or beliefs, but are equally valid paths of salvation and of authentic experience of the real. Again, there are many incompatible truth claims that divide religions, so this is problematic uh, for hard pluralism. Here, um, Hick, or um, a hard pluralist, might reply that that's irrelevant to knowledge of the real and the salvific process, just because you have incompatible truth claims. Um, <clears throat> it is still possible that these different religions can be equally effective in, uh, as means of bringing believers to salvation. Moreover, the hard pluralist would, would say that the real, ultimately, and Hick is big on this point, is ineffable. It's not something that can be uh, put into words or expressed in human language and categories. It's beyond the grasp of human thought. W Ward makes, a, I think, a, a, uh, a good response here. He says that if the real is ineffable, if the ultimate reality is beyond the grasp of human thought and language, then how can we know it, it that it exists? Um, can you have it both ways? Can you maintain that something is beyond human, the grasp of human thought and language, but then uh, be confident that it's even there? So that's a problem for, uh, for hard pluralism. He says, if no truth claim can apply to the real, then how can we say anything about it? You know, how can we theorize, as, as Hick does to this extent, that he's confident there's this ultimate reality that transcends all of the particular religious categories. Um, if it is so transcendent, <laughs> how can we know for sure that it's there or have any confidence that there is this ultimate reality beyond the interpretive religious and theological frameworks that we supposedly apply to it? And if the real is unknowable, how can we know that all claims about it are equally valid? Um, you would have to know what the ultimate reality is in itself to be able to assess the different theological and religious frameworks uh, attempts to interpret it. So there seems to be an inconsistency here in terms of claims about the unknowability of the ultimate reality uh, and, and implications that, well, we can know enough about the ultimate reality to know that the different religious traditions are roughly equal in their uh, accuracy in interpreting this, this reality. Ward notes that Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, maintained that we do have genuine, if analogical, knowledge of God, but we cannot comprehend God's nature in itself. It's God's essence that is ineffable. Um, this Thomistic view affirms that our recognition of divine ineffability is based in a genuine knowledge of God. So, you know, uh, Aquinas is certainly no Hickian pluralist here. We do have genuine knowledge of God, even if it is analogical knowledge, it's real. Um, and even if we're limited in terms of our ability uh, or walled off from our ability to really grasp the, the true essence of God, we, we have knowledge of God nonetheless. So the, the error, the, the Kantian error that Hick makes, according to Ward, um, is this, that Kant maintained that the noumenal reality is the cause of all of the phenomenal ex experiences that we have. Um, but in maintaining this, Kant, quote, applies the categories of the mind beyond the permissible range of cognitive meaning, as, as Ward puts it. Um, he's, he's claiming, he, 
He's claiming more knowledge than his epistemology really entitles him to, to claim. Um, if the noumenal or the in itself is, is uh, beyond the reach of human cognition, then, then how can he say as much as he does about it? Ward says that, that Kant, or that like Kant, John Hick is, quote, unable to renounce theoretical claims about the real entirely. It's, it's, it's irresistible. Even when you're, uh, in, even in the context of making claims in defense of religious pluralism, Hick can't help himself in terms of making claims about the ultimate reality that he says that we can't ultimately know. Furthermore, Ward says that Hick doesn't go far enough in making assertions about the real. He says it would be better if he abandoned the Kantian line that the real is noumenal or ultimately beyond the, the reach of the human mind and simply say that the real is an ultimate unity of reality and value, that would be better. Um, that would be more in, uh, in, in sync with uh, an exclusivist perspective. Ward notes that Hick affirms that there is a proper goal of human activity, which is reality-centered life and that this presupposes that this must be consciously attained, which in turn implies that one must have certain correct beliefs in order to achieve it. Um, so again, there's kind of uh, maybe a, a, a tacit recognition of certain key exclusivist ideas in Hick that he can't get away from. But um, if that's the case, Ward sa says, we may ask what sorts of beliefs must one hold in order to be saved? This, this raises a very interesting question. Um, what is it exactly that one must believe, say as a Christian, um, in order to achieve salvation? To what extent are beliefs even necessary uh, are beliefs of a certain kind necessary in order for one to be saved? This, lots of interesting questions here. <clears throat> if you insist that, well, certain beliefs are necessary, um, certain cognitive states uh, for Christian salvation, then that would rule out the possibility that toddlers, infants, or aborted fetuses could ever be saved. They don't have uh, any you know, cognitive um, acceptance of Christian ideas yet. They're unable to, uh, to process things cognitively. But every Christian I've ever known has, has maintained that at least many, if not all, infants and uh, fetuses that die in utero are saved. So clearly God uh, is capable of and, and does, if one holds that view, save many people who don't have <coughs> any kind of cognitive embrace of, of Christian truth. Um, so do things change as one gets older? That would be a standard view that once you reach a certain age of, kind of cognitive maturity, then it becomes a requirement. But what is that age? There's a, there's a, there's a kind of vagueness problem there. Um, so the whole question of uh, kind of um, accountability, rational accountability in terms of um, salvation questions is a very interesting one that's, that's related here. So, you're right, this is the question that all of us uh, who are theists and Christians in particular need to wrestle with, whether one is an exclusivist or an inclusivist, um, or a pluralist, what exactly is the necessary condition for salvation? Ward's response is that metaphysics is not what saves us. For Christians, the act of God establishing creatures and knowledge and love of him does that. And I think that's a, um, that's certainly a, a safe and correct claim. God is the one that establishes us in our salvation. But, Still, this is a 
separate question, even if you want to look at it as kind of manifestations or symptomatic of the fact that God is working salvifically in one's life, what sorts of uh, consequences or indicators of that will there be uh, for us cognitive, cognitively in terms of our beliefs? You could talk about in those terms, what are the, what are the indicators of salvation? Uh, cognitively for human beings. Here's, um, here Ward suggests another version of pluralism which he considers defensible and important. He calls it soft pluralism, the view that the real can manifest in many traditions and humans can respond to it appropriately in them. Um, which really sounds a lot like religious inclusivism. Uh, the inclusivism of someone like a C.S. Lewis. He was a, a sort of Christian inclusivist um, that God can and does work in Christian salvation in the hearts of certain people um, in even other religious contexts or in um, situations or contexts where there's not even uh, a formal religious uh, system embraced by a person. So, according to the Christian inclusivists, there's one exclusive truth regarding uh, the way of salvation for human beings, and that's through Christ, uh, through the applied grace of God uh, in a person's life, but that God can do this outside of context of uh, formal Christian religious practice, the question is, well, in what form does that take? Well, it, it could take any number of forms, uh, depending on the situation. So that would be more of an inclus inclusivistic approach. I think that's what Ward is getting at here. So to summarize Ward's critique of uh, Hicks pluralism, um, Hicks pluralism affirms, again, that there is something wholly unknowable that is the ultimate reality, the ultimate divine reality. All experiences of it are equally authentic and all paths to fuller experience of it are equally valid. The problem is, as Ward has maintained, if it is the case that there's something wholly unknowable, that first proposition is true, then the second and third propositions can't be asserted. We can't know that all experiences of it are equally authentic. And we can't know that all paths to fuller experience of it are equally valid. So, um, you know, Hick is making claims that he just has no way to rationally justify. Uh, so, that is uh, Hick's pluralism, and that's Ward's critique of uh, religious pluralism. This is Dr. James Spiegel in his teaching on the philosophy of religion. This is session number 12, Religious Pluralism. Mm -hmm.